We're going to talk a little bit about higher fly taxonomy and classification. This can be a bit of a dry topic, so we don't want to go too much into this, but this basically, you know, Charles Darwin had one of the first trees that you can see here where he, based on his finding of evolution, kind of started to classify animals and uh, plants. And this is what he drew famously in one of his books. Um, so we're gonna talk about taxonomy, classification and systematics. Those are terms that you might come across when you read about fireflies and you know descriptions or so in papers. So taxonomy is the science that we use for describing, naming and classifying organisms. So how do we know a firefly is in the family Lampyridae? Basically because of taxonomy and someone described it and was like, oh, this has light organs, maybe that, that you, they use that and they put it in this family. And for the next, you know, for the next 200 some years, if something had a light organ, they may have put it in there. But then they found out that there's click, were, uh, click beetles and pangodids that have light organs. So the classification had to be changed. Um, naming, um, you know, giving these scientific um, names to um, things like, you know, you have your Photinus paralis or Elecnia now Photinus coruscus. That's the scientific name. And I saw in the Q&A, someone called it the winter firefly. That's the common name. But common names can be confusing because in different areas of the world or even in one country, a common name might make, name different things. But if I talk to a scientist in Japan that studies fireflies and I say Photinus paralis, they will know exactly what species I mean. So sometimes common names can be confusing, but they are also very good to relay with the public because you know um, studying scientific name can be daunting and stressful or you know hard. So you don't want to maybe you know do that and. So common names have their place. That there's no doubt about that. And not all fireflies have a common name. Of the 2,400 plus species we have described, I'd say less than 20% have one. And in different countries. So, but Lynn Faust in her book gave all the North America, all the Eastern North American ones, a common name. So we have a point how to communicate that. So that's sometimes a good thing, but because of the lack of common names, sometimes it's a hinder, it hinders communication about them. Then classification is the arrangement of organisms in taxonomic groups according to their observed similarities. Like I said, the light organs or the antennae or something like that. The antennae would be a good, you know, sometimes it's a good place to organize them in the level of genus, while the light organ might be a good way to put them in the super family or the family. So we're going to talk about these different levels in a little bit. And then systematics, we combine taxonomy and classification and do these you know, morphological studies that we actually look at the specimen or we look at the molecular level or sometimes we combine them. And that's the when it's kind of like perfect world where we can draw information from morphology and molecular and maybe behavior or other things and use all that information to come up with a new classification and, taxo uh, and taxonomy for you know, what we're studying. And so, like I said, this was one of the first trees by Charles Darwin. On the right side, you see a much more modern tree. This is from 2019, mm -hmm. Gavin Martin et al. Um, um, where he did the latest phylogeny or classification of fireflies on a world level. He um, didn't have all the firefly genera, so he didn't have a specimen from each genus. He clearly didn't have all the species, but this is basically a great piece of information that we can use to infer relationships between things and we can classify firefly, we're used to, you know, used to classify new findings, where do they belong? And you know, 
in how fireflies related to each other, the different species, the different genera. And this is this was a great paper and long overdue one. But classification changes all the time. And here it's just zoomed in on that lower part. Here you have the different colors, and I'm zoomed in on the subfamily in blue. It's uh, subfamily Lampyrini um, in the family Lampyridae. And here you can see the different genera and how they're related. Like here where my mouse is, if you can see that, Pyrectomina is close related to Espizoma. Down here, you can actually see that you have Photina species. And here you have Elichnia species. In the middle, at the bottom here, in the middle of the Photina species, you have the Elichnia species, right? So this could either mean that Photinus is not a good ge genus because they're not all together, or it could mean like currently it is inferred that Elichnia is not a genus, but they are just uh, for tiny species. And that's something that I think different people are still looking into and will hopefully have some more information that's based on morphology and molecular uh, soon in the future. What you have to realize is that classification changes a lot. And while we have it now, there will be a new paper out maybe tomorrow, maybe in a year that the whole classification can change again based on better information, based on more information. But for now, Gavin's paper is the best one. And we're gonna go a little bit through the classification. So fireflies are in the, cl the class in sector. So all the insects, like your butterflies, your beetles, your um, true bugs, your wasps, bees, and all those things. Um, there's like almost 30 orders of insects. And here's an order. So fireflies in the order Coleoptera, which is the beetles. And here you have a wide array of different beetle families by made by Ross Piper. Uh, these are all saprocylic beetles, so there will be not a uh, wood eating beetle, so there will not be a, a firefly in this, but you can see beetles are very diverse. It's the biggest group of animals in the world. There's over 450,000 um, species described out of the 1.6 million or so described species of plants and animals. So one every fourth animal is a beetle. There's a super family, Elatoroidea, which includes things like um, your click beetles, your fireflies, your soldier beetles, cantharidae, ragothalmids, fengodids, omalicids. Some of the families are really small and um, very rare, but you know, you come across your lysids and lysids are very good mimics or maybe fireflies are mimics of lysids, but they're very similar. Um, so you might come across that uh, in Douglas at all in 2021, very controversial to me. They said that maybe all bioluminescent elateroidea, like the fireflies, the ragothalmus fingodids, might just be derived click beetle. Um, for now, they didn't do anything. They didn't change the classification, but they're suggesting that. Um, we'll see in the future what happens. Fireflies are in the fa family, Lampyridae, um, a family name. You will always recognize the last four letters of a family name are the letters I, D, A, E. That's how you can recognize a, fa a firefly uh, a family name. And it stands, it's Latin for shining light. And here on the right side, you have this little graphic with different names of fireflies around the world. Big, Big Dipper, which is usually Potinus perellus. Uh, lightning bark lampyridae, calip calip. Uh, it's in Asia. It's from Asia. Glühwurm is from Germany, where I'm from. Um, Labette de Adefeu is a name from the West Indian Islands, from the French-speaking part. It means beast of fire, which might be my favorite common name for fireflies. So there's they are known in many places under different names. Subfamily is Lampyrini. So a subfamily has um, the last letters I N A E. And you can see on the right, we have uh, currently um, 12 subfamilies recognized. 
And the ones in bold are the ones that you will be able to find in the US and Canada. So terotony, ototretony, lamprohyzony, silocleidony, photorony, lamprohyzony, and chesperitorony, which is the, which um, was the last one of the North American ones described. Um, after that, you can have tribes. Um, Potinini is a tribe name. Um, they usually end in INI. Um, these are mainly used in the largest of the firefly subfamily, Lampyrini. There is a few in other subfamilies, but they're really not used there um, co commonly. But in the Lampyrini, because we have so many species, we use um, tribes. The next level is the genus, which is this first part of a species, Photinus porellis. The first word is Photinus is the genus name. It's Latina, it's italicized because it's uh, Latin or Greek. And currently we have over 140 of these genera in the world. And then next, this is the species name. So the species name is not, for Photinus porellis is not porellis. It's actually for Tinus Pirellis. Pirellis by itself is the specific epithet and should usually not be used by itself. So if you talk about the species with a, with a scientific name, use both words uh, for Tinus Pirellis. Then often in literature, if you see the name after that, Linnaeus 1758. So Linnaeus was the person that described the species in 1758. And it has parentheses in this case around it because Pirellis was not originally described in the genus Photinus, but it was actually described in the genus Cantharis and then has been switched based on new evidence, based on new classification, has been switched to first Lampyrus Pirellis and then to uh, Photinus Pirellis. So the name goes in parentheses. If the name has, not, has no parentheses of a describer, it is still in the original genus it was described. Um, Diana, um, the lowest level for taxonomy, if you can get it to genus, that's always great. And it helps a lot. A lot of the genera we have do not have a lot of species. So we can help with that after that. Um, for some others, specific would be nice, but it's not always possible for a citizen scientist without a microscope. And I am currently working on a catalog for the world species, which hopefully I will submit this year. And I can tell you that we have over 2,400 species currently. And the last ones described were actually described less than a week ago from uh, Thailand, four new species of the uh, genus Mediopteryx. Um, so we have around 2,430 species, I think, currently plus minus a couple that uh, maybe I have uh, not looked at every paper and might have not included everything. Uh, classifications keep changing. Here's a few of the classifications we had just based on the subfamilies that were recognized, starting with Olivier in 1910, which I misspelled, McDermott 66, Croson, and then Martin et al, uh, 2019. Um, he is the most current based on evidence of molecular evidence. But since he published the paper, two more subfamilies have been described, Chesperitoini and Cladodini. So these have not been included. And like I said before, please be aware, it will change again. Yelena Pacheco, um, she's a student, a doctoral student at the University of Georgia, is currently in her last or second to last semester. And she has taken Gavin's data set, added a lot of species to it, and is currently working on the analyses of that. And within the next year or two, we will have a new classification of fireflies and with a lot more data points and a lot more information. So please be on the lookout for that. It will be coming out soon. Um, we talked about this classification keeps changing here. Uh, your Photinus and your Elichnia. 
Ehrlichia, in a lot of cases, or Photinus now looks very different from what you would think a Photinus looks, but they are currently the same thing. Um, then a little bit about type. If you hear the word a type, um, what are types and why they're important? So a type is a specific specimen and a holotype in specific, specifically is a specific type, a specimen that the whole gene, uh, the whole species in this case was described based upon. This on the screen is the holotype of Paraphorsis ex eximus, um, which you can find at the Ohio State collection of uh, collection at the Ohio State uh, University. Um, the, they made this picture available for me. And you can see here the specimen from the above view and the labels. And in the blue label, you can see it is designated as a holotype. So this specimen is the one specimen, if you are in doubt, you should look at to compare to see what species you have. Each species should have one. Holotype, we talked about, is a type specimen that is sole, the sole representative of a named species group taxon. Very important. They are usually, in most cases, 99% of the cases, just deposited in the museum. As a researcher, we, if we work on fireflies and we want to describe new species, we usually look at holotypes of the other species to make sure we have a new one. Then you have allotypes. Um, they're not quite as important as a holotype. They have no standing according to the zoological code of nomenclature, other than they are a paratype of the opposite sex. So if your holotype is a male, your allotype will be a female or vice versa. And then you have paratypes, which are all the other specimens other than the holotype that were used in the description of the species and were designated. Uh, in the paper is said, these are the paratypes. So sometimes you have the holotype and a series of paratypes to look at to describe or identify your species. Very important. Why is this important? Because sometimes they get lost. In the case of Futuris pennsylvanica, which is the state uh, insect of Pennsylvania, it turned out the type that was described by the year in 1700 something was lost. And we didn't have anything to compare this. So Chris Heckscher and uh, James Lloyd posthumously and uh, Mark Branham Actually, in 2022, they found populations of Futurus pennsylvanica in Delaware, and they nominate, uh, they uh, designated a neotype from that uh, population. So we act actually have now something that we compare this species again against. So that was very uh, important on a from an taxonomic nomenclatural standpoint to have this neotype designated. With neotype just means it's not the original holotype, but it is in place of this holotype now. And uh, this paper is also available. If any of you want it, just let me know. Um, and it turns out that the species is actually not in Pennsylvania, which is kind of a tragedy because now they, in a way, they lost their state insect. So, very interesting story if you want to read the paper. Um, we're talking a bit about geogra zo geographic realms. So in zoology, we have these areas that were kind of designated that have kind of like an overlap of animals and plant species. Um, these are all the areas. And we are in America, we are in the, in the Arctic, the light blue on the left. And the closest to our Fireflies on a in that level is the neotropical, which is mostly um, part, most of Mexico and down and so, down south all the way down to Chile and uh, Argentina. Um, and our species are mostly related to, while the old world, as it's called, Europe, Asia, and stuff, Australia, they have a very different um, fauna usually. And just a little comparison, like I said, we're in the Arctic, which is Canada. The United States, uh, without um, Hawaii, parts in parts of Mexico, just the northern part of Mexico, as you can see here. So Mexico is kind of like taken 
away from the, uh, part of it is in the neotropics. We have 23 genera of fireflies and 200 species about, maybe a little more. I wasn't quite sure how many are there in Northern Mexico. So this number might be a little higher. And then comparable, the neotropics, which have the West Indies, central parts of most of Central America and South America, you have at least 70 genera and over a thousand species um, in those parts. And a lot of researchers think that fireflies originated in the neotropics and then um, spread out across the world. But um, the neotropics are hyper diverse and lots of researchers are working on them now, thank God, because it, it, for a long time, it was not very, very understudied. Now it's you now people work on it and a lot of new species in general are actually coming out of, especially countries like Brazil and uh, hopefully more is to come. Um, there's um, general like Futinus or Espizoma. These are genera that are widespread. We have them for in the US, but they spread all the way down to Brazil, um, both of them. And interestingly, there's actually now a Futinus in Europe, in uh, Portugal, uh, Spain, and I think France now, which is spreading around a little bit, which they were very confused when it started flashing because it's very different from the European species. And we're still trying to figure out how it got there. Um, the original species was described from Argentina um, and it's now in, in Europe. So how did it get there? And so now um, a little bit about the DNA barcoding, which is an interesting way of identifying fireflies possibly to species easier than maybe morphology. Uh, it costs a little bit of money, but it might be easy, easier for, um, you know, if you have the possibility of doing this. It's a partial sequence of the mitochondrial gene CO1. It's about 750 base pairs out of the whole um, gene. Um, it's supposed to be very easy to do. And Hebert et al, who came up with this, say that you can identify almost every species based on a barcode. Um, I think there are some limitations, but that has to be still looked at. Um, it's very helpful for ecologists, conservationists, your foreign forensic scientists to discover and monitor biodiversity. You'll require your firefly sample, either the larvae or the adult, or even any of the other life stages. You have to extract the DNA, uh, amplify the, P, uh, the DNA with your PCR reaction so you have a bigger sample that you can then sequence. And you can do all of that. Uh, you can send a firefly in, you put it in alcohol and eat ethanol, and you can send the specimen in and places will do this for you for a price uh, if you don't have the capability yourself. Uh, after the sequencing, you get this barcode back here, this 750 base pair chunk of DNA that you then can go on GenBank, which is a website where scientists or any other person can deposit this DNA sequence and if you then have your own, you got it back, you have your back and you were like, oh, that's I wanna know what firefly this is. You can pluck this chunk of DNA, this, which is letters, you're gonna get the ACGTs, your uh, DNA letters back. It's just like 750 spaces of one of those four letters. And you can plug it into GenBank and it will give you a comparison. And if that species will has been um, amplified before, you might get an answer. If it has not, but another species has, then you might um, get a related species and it might say like it's 85% related to, let's say Photinus pirellus is what you had. It's 85% related to Photinus coruscus, or in that case, maybe a little less, but you know it's in this genus at least then. If, all the spe if your species is in it, hopefully it would come up with 99% or something like that. It can help you with cryptic species. So you have a lot of species like for tourists maybe, and no one has done this, where you can sequence the CO1 and maybe figure out how many for tourists, different for tourist species are in a, in a 
region. You can use this for immature and adult. Like I said before, we can sequence the larva, we can sequence the adult. Do they have 99 or more match? We have the same species. And it, can, it is a support for morphology. I have a hard time saying that it's, you should use it by itself. You should always try to confirm what you have with your molecular with morphology. So it's not a substitute for traditional taxonomy, but it's a very, very useful and complementary tool. And this phylogeny that Gavin Martin did was based on hundreds of genes, not just one. So much more information was used to um, come up with that. And so not, please don't think this is the last, like you're all in all solution to figure out what species you have. Uh, limitations, you must trust the identifications that have been submitted online. If someone misidentified something, it might be a problem. And the, the lack of available sequences for many species or groups or something, which fireflies have a lot more than some other groups. But here you can see one of the trees that someone plucked in their one uh, sequence, and then it was compared to all the other sequences that were given, and some of them you can see there's some clusters here, all the Pennsylvania, all the quadrifugians are, are thrown together. This might indicate that, they, that the identifications were correct, but not always because here you have a Lucy Crescent and a Pennsylvania. So one of the two was definitely identified incorrectly. Advantage of this is it's very cheap and very easy. And I use this, and this paper is also in the works for the larval description of Pyrectomina galeata from Puerto Rico. I collected, uh, we barcoded both adults and larvae, and we are currently finishing up the manuscript after several years. Uh, and this will be the first larval description of any firefly from Puerto Rico, and only the second one of all the 186 species from the West Indies. And then this is, a, this, example of things not to do with barcoding. This scientist, Michael Sharkey from Kentucky, he uses barcodes to describe them. He doesn't do any morphology. He doesn't describe how the specimen looks. He just gives you the barcode in the paper and says, this is this species. If you get this barcode, you have this species. But if you would see the specimen, you could not identify it because there's no information giving and how it looks. And okay. on the right, you see an opinion paper where they are talking about why this is not a good idea and why it still uses, why you still should use morphology to do so, to do identify your things. Oliver, so, just yes. quickly, we had a question in the Q&A about eDNA that I thought yeah. might be worth uh, answering live. As far as I know, no, I have not come across any paper like that. Um, it would be interesting to see for some of the species that use chemicals for communication, if that's a possibility. But again, as far as I know, no, I have not seen a paper. If anybody has, please put it in the chat or in the Q&A. I don't think anybody has come across this or has done this. And yeah, there would be some cool species like Pterotus or uh, maybe Lutaicalis, uh, Lucidoda Lutaicalis to do this on and see if that would work. But yeah, no, sadly not. <laughs> 